Good afternoon. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second of a series of symposia as part of the Expect, Engage, Empower Transition Initiative. I am April Trice, a Vocational Rehabilitation Program Specialist at the Rehabilitation Services Administration. We are happy you've joined us and have a full agenda to get to. But first, there are a few housekeeping items to share before we begin. One, this event will be recorded and posted to the Expect, Engage, Empower website following the event. And while there is no live chat, audience members are welcome to submit questions by clicking the Q&A button. You can also access the live captioning by clicking the CC button. And last, please submit any technical questions to OSEP dash eee at air.org. Now let's turn our attention to today's event. The Expect, Engage, Empower Transition Initiative challenges the field to join ulcers to raise expectations, engage families earlier, and empower all who support transition services to measurably and significantly improve post-secondary outcomes for children and youth with disabilities and their families. Now I would like to introduce two individuals who have recognized the importance of successful secondary transitions, which led to the creation of this initiative. Dante Allen is the Commissioner of the Rehabilitation Services Administration, and Valerie C. Williams is the Director of the Office of Special Education Programs. Over to you, Commissioner Allen. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. The goal of the 3E initiative is to provide an opportunity for the field to join us in OSERS and the challenge to raise expectations, to engage families earlier, and to fully empower all individuals who support transition services to improve post-school outcomes for children and youth with disabilities and their families. Vocational rehabilitation specialists general and special education teachers, related service providers, and administrators can all support high expectations, engagement, and empowerment by building their collective capacities to support children, youth, and young adults with disabilities and their families throughout their educational and professional endeavors. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, provides protections and ensures a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment for eligible children with disabilities. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973, or Rehabilitation Act, prepares job seekers, including students and youth with disabilities, to obtain, maintain, and advance an employment in the competitive labor market through education, training, and supportive services. As an individual with a disability, I received VR services that enabled me to secure employment and advance in my career. Without such, I would not be speaking with you in my capacity as RSA commissioner. As a result, I understand the essential role that VR services, when coupled with a strong foundation provided by services available under IDEA, can play in the transition of students with disabilities from high school to post-school achievements in post-secondary education and competitive integrated employment. Today, we're going to discuss more than what the letters of these laws require. We will start to explore the powerful intent behind them. We have a wonderful range of guests joining us, but before we introduce them, I would like to introduce my colleague, friend, and partner in this initiative, the Director of the Office of Special Education Programs, Valerie Williams. Thank you, Dante. I'm grateful for this opportunity to collaborate with you in this incredibly important initiative. And good afternoon or morning to all of you, depending on where you are. I hope you're doing well and 2024 is off to a great start. As we have said since the beginning, this initiative is a call to action to transform how we see, plan and implement secondary transition services to advance educational equity, excellence, and post-school outcomes for students with disabilities and their families. We kicked off this initiative on May 10th last year 
by hearing about the experiences of students, families, and practitioners who have engaged in the secondary transition process and what high expectations, engagement, and empowerment mean to them. Those powerful stories set the stage for our subsequent symposium on belonging. Belonging beyond inclusion is such a powerful concept, whether we're talking about school, community, or workplace settings. Today's symposium is focused on going beyond the IDEA and WIOA requirements, knowing what to expect when it matters. I wanna thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us for this incredibly important topic. Today, we'll hear from families, youth, young adults, and professionals about their own experiences to prepare and prepare others for the many transitions that occur to drive the best possible outcomes. We view today's symposia and other upcoming activities as rich investments in the future of students and youth with disabilities, one that can affect change beginning at the earliest ages, raise our expectations, lead to expanded engagement, and empower families and individuals with disabilities to maximize opportunities for success. Every day, we need to do all that we can to assist families and practitioners in understanding and ensuring those requirements are not only implemented, but exceeded. Additionally, we must ensure that they are prepared well in advance of educational milestones as they move through the education system. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. David Bateman. David is a principal researcher at the American Institutes for Research and is finishing up this academic year as a professor at Shippensburg University in the Department of Educational Leadership and Special Education, where he teaches courses on special education law, assessment, and facilitating inclusion. He's a former due process hearing officer for Pennsylvania, and he uses his knowledge of litigation related to special education to assist school districts in providing appropriate supports for children with disabilities. He has been a classroom teacher of students with learning disabilities, behavior disorders, intellectual disabilities, and hearing impairments. Today, David will share his considerable knowledge about federal requirements and important considerations for the secondary transition process. David, the floor is yours. Welcome. It's nice to be part of uh, this process with you. I look forward to talking with you in the next couple hours about this. But what I want to do is I'm going to start with a story. I'm just going to bring this uh, to so we all understand what we're talking about as we talk about this. My neighbor, Mike, is an 11-year-old boy who faces the dual challenges of having a visual impairment and cerebral palsy. When his parents, guided by my advice, inquired about potential career paths for someone like Mike with his resource room teacher, the response was uncertain. I don't really know. If you can figure this out, you'll help yourself and you'll help a lot of other people too. This conversation highlighted a gap in knowledge among many of the professionals about the capabilities and possibilities of individuals with disabilities, underscoring the importance of advocacy and informed support. In advocating for Mike, we encountered resistance rooted in basically unfamiliarity and concern. The principal of Mike's prospective school listed several reasons why enrollment might be problematic including a lack of experience with students who are blind, the absence of braille knowledge among staff, and the school's physical layout, which included many, many stairs. Mike's straightforward response to the mention of stairs is, I walked up the stairs to get here, served as a poignant reminder of the often overlooked capabilities of individuals with disabilities. Despite these challenges, we had to persist, emphasizing the importance of giving Mike a chance to succeed in a mainstream environment and advocating for his right to pursue academic excellence rather than prematurely directed towards a trade school. My experiences over the years have taught me the critical role of collaboration between parents and educators in supporting children with disabilities. Parents must be proactive advocates for their children, while educators should embrace the opportunity to work alongside families. This partnership is essential for fostering an environment where children can learn self-advocacy a skill as vital as any academic or vocational training. As my father wisely advised me during my youth, independence is crucial. We must prepare our children for a future where they can advocate for themselves, whether, in, in, whether as part of an individualized education program meeting or in planning for employment. Many states have programs that prepare individuals with disabilities for post-secondary life. 
but you and I have know that not, that not everyone is going to go to college, nor should they. Some states have work skills programs. It teaches many of the same skills that were taught in college-bound programs, but can be provided work experiences right there on college campuses. Students can do jobs that range from emptying waste baskets and doing maintenance to working in the IT departments. The work around the work the work around all the soft skills is vital, and it's important as we talk about this. Recognizing the path to success varies greatly. It's evident that not every individual is suited for college, vocational school, or even technical training. Each person has unique individual abilities, skills, and interests. And the key lies in identifying and nurturing these areas. Whether a student is drawn to mathematics, creative endeavors, or writing, finding their passion and strengths is a first step towards a fulfilling career. In my quest to demystify the journey for individuals with disabilities, I formulated a set of guiding principles, and I do a lot of workshops, but I call it the, basically the ABCs of navigating life for students with disabilities. Focuses, it focuses on empowerment and practical strategies. So let me walk you just through A through F and why this is important. A stands for access. Success is deeply interconnected with access. Access to role models who inspire. Comprehensive information, access to innovative inspiration, access to reliable transportation, and access to a supportive network of staff and peers. This approach to accessibility is the gateway to unlocking opportunities and realizing the potential for individuals with all types of disabilities. B focuses on barrier-free communication organization. The capacity to effectively com communicate and organize one's life is fundamental. This encompasses a broad range of strategies from adaptive technologies to personalized methods for note-taking and information management, whether it involves speech-to-text software, sign language, or other assistive devices, identifying and utilizing the right tools are crucial for independence and success. C is for customized mobility solutions. Achieving independence and mobility is vital for personal growth and participation in society. Customized mobility solutions cater to the diverse needs of individuals with disabilities, whether it involves uh, access in a wheelchair, navigational aids, or modified vehicles. The essence of mobility aut autonomy lies in the empowerment. Individuals feel to navigate their environments confidently and safely, fosters both independence and self-reliance. D stands for diverse educational outcomes. Education should be inclusive and adaptable meeting the unique needs of each learner. The principle, this principle advocates for a range of educational settings, curricular, and teaching methods that accommodates the various uh, abilities of individuals with disabilities. From specialized programs to inclusive classrooms that utilize basically universal design for learning, the goal is to ensure all students have the opportunity to thrive academically and develop their full potential. E emphasizes empowerment through technology. Technology plays a transformative role in leveling the playing field for individuals with disabilities. Assistive technology, such as screen readers, voice recognition software, and adaptive hardware, enable greater autonomy and access to the digital world. Empowerment through technology means not only providing the tools, but also ensuring that individuals have the training and support to use them effectively, thereby enhancing their ability to study, work, and engage in community life. And F, is for family, family support and involvement. The role of families in the development and well-being of individuals with disabilities cannot be overstated. Family support and involvement are critical components in advocating for rights, accessing services, and providing the emotional and practical assistance to navigate life's challenges. Encouraging strong family bonds and active participation in educational and developmental processes ensures that individuals with disabilities receive the encouragement, resources and love they need to achieve their goals and life fulfilling and live fulfilling lives. This principle highlights the importance of empowerment families, of empowering families with knowledge, resources and community connections to effectively support their loved ones. So understanding that, it's also important for us to remind ourselves the importance of soft skills. The soft skills of navigating social environments, organizing time, and effective note-taking are critical to academic success. These skills are often the differentiators between success and struggle for students with disabilities. 
As we look to the future, it's clear that the landscape of work and technology is evolving rapidly. I mean this, by, but we need to think about offering new opportunities for individuals with disabilities to thrive in diverse environments. This era of change brings both excitement and hope for what lies ahead. To the families watching, know that your involvement and advocacy are invaluable. Your support shapes the future of your child, providing a foundation of love, of understanding and encouragement. As someone who's seeing the impact of disability within my own family, I understand the challenges and joys. You are not alone in this journey. I'd find, I find two other points. I just had a good interview with some people from a disability services at a good university. I asked them, why do some students with disabilities succeed while, other, while some others fail? What have you found? When I ask about this, I hear that some students don't know how to travel, they don't know how to take notes, they don't know how to get along with other people. They may have the hard skills, the academic strength, but what if they don't have the soft skills of getting around, organizing their time, note-taking, and getting along with other people, they're at a great disadvantage. Finally, this is going to be, next year's are going to be very exciting. I want to make sure that when you're watching, I'm very excited that your child is lucky to have you and make sure that you understand that you might not, they, they may not always articulate it, but you're the best support for them. And finally, I speak as a family member. My wife's older brother has severe intellectual disabilities. Growing up, she thought every family member, family had a family member with a disability. My wife and I have assumed increased care and responsibilities for him. And just last week attended his, his, uh, his individual plan talking about his goals and objectives for the next few years. Family life continues, and we have to remind ourselves of this, and we have to think about what we can do about this. So in conclusion, I just want to gather. We gather here to not just discuss, but to learn. We gather to share and envision a future where every individual, regardless of disability, has the opportunity to achieve their fullest potential. Your presence and willingness to engage in this conversation marks a significant step forward for our community. I appreciate this, and I look forward to the speakers that we're gonna be having today. Today, we have a special session that shines a light on the critical role of engagement, support, and inclusion in the educational journey of students with special needs. Our discussion is led by Johan, Johan Mora Valverde, the engagement manager of the SPAN Parent Agency Network, who will, who will open our conversation about this. I'm expecting our panels to delve into the importance of understanding legal aspects, preparing for transitions from early childhood education to adulthood, and the ongoing challenges of ensuring every student receives the opportunity and support. Join us as we navigate these important topics, share experiences, and discuss strategies for fostering an inclusive and supportive educational environment for all. Hi, my name is Johan Mora Valverde, and I'm the Youth Engagement Manager at the SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. Just want to start by saying thank you, David. Your remarks resonated with myself and the work we do um, with youth during transition. Um, there is a lot to prepare for our families during and entering the school system, and then transition to adult is a challenge. There's lots to learn. Understanding the law is very helpful, but there's so much more to it. Um, and your remarks also set the stage for the rest of our guests. And so please join me in a warm welcome to our first panelist. Uh, we have Kelsey Biswinger, who is a parent mentor at the Michigan Alliance for Families. We have Macy, who is a student in the Metro Detroit area, Michigan. And Peggy, a first grade teacher. And Amanda, a special education resource teacher in the metro Detroit area of Michigan. Um, so let's start. Um, Macy, I have a question for you. Lots of questions. But... Yeah. Yeah, okay, ready. So what do you like most about school this year? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Do I know? Do you like recess? I like recess. You like recess? What do you like about recess? You play with your friends? Yeah, I like. Okay. It's my thing. I hold the box with my friends when I play and I like to get at the end. We only want to be at school. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
in recess, playing with your friends, being cool. I like that. Um, can, Macy, can you tell me, I want to learn about this. What is Lunch Bunch? Wait, is cut a hearing off and then they start in the bathroom and we have a one and we have a double here and we go. Okay, all right. That's a lot. So you're at lunch, you're eating, you're sharing, you're learning. Oh, awesome. Um, let's talk about you, Macy. What makes you a good friend? Right. I love having friends. And my mom, she wanted to go to I also want to know, who is your best advocate? Right. Who's your best advocate? Yeah. Can you say it louder so they can hear you? Uh, how about you say it first and I'll say it after. Oh, Maisie's her own best advocate. I bet you can say that though. Yeah. <laughs> I love Maisie, yes, best advocate, <laughs> advocate, yes. If you had a question, okay, I want to hear a question from you now. If you had a question about something at school, what would you do? Like, I raise my hand. Usually, I have a father and I raise my hand. Yeah. And then what happens? You raise your hand and someone would help? Yeah. Who likes to help? Mom. Happy. I both make them happy. Who said I have that? No. Okay. She can never go to school. I don't know about school yet. I mean, go to school at me. Okay. Thank you. Let me, I never get in school. Thank you, Macy. Uh, we are going to move on to Kelsey, Amanda, and Peggy. Um, and let's start with Kelsey. Let's begin by hearing a little bit about how you feel about this school year and how it's going. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, the school year has been going really well and Maisie has been enjoying her time and it's been a good year. I, I will say that there's always work to be done as we continue to make sure that we support Maisie and we always wanna make sure that we start off the year on a good foot too. So how do we make sure that everything goes well? One of the things that I think that we do a really good job of, and that is important, is just realizing that it takes a united team. And we may have some bumps in the road, which we of course did, but just like Maisie you know, is working through, we work through together. So one of the things that was a little challenging at the start of the year is in the state of Michigan, just like everywhere, we had some staff changes. So there was a newer team, so it was just getting to know everyone and make sure that we figure out the communication needs and, you know, moving from kindergarten to first grade can be an adjustment too. So how do we support that independence and continue to figure out our communication and just build on that trust and understanding? One of the other things that our team did a really good job of is making sure that we wanted Maisie to feel included from the get-go. So making sure that she is able to participate in you know, the smallest ways like lowering a coat hook to put her own coat away or maybe the desk so she can reach, but also making sure that she can sit by peers that she's familiar with. Izzy does have a communication disorder and she can be shy around new people and it's uh, harder her, for her to communicate when she doesn't know anyone. So how do we do that? How do we make her feel in included and um, able to participate. So that's something that the team really did a good job coming up with those individualized creative solutions to meet her needs. Thank you. And talking about the school year, Peggy, what does educational experience look like for Macy? Maisie spends the majority of her day in our gen ed classroom. So beginning with her morning routine, she's putting her things away with the help of peer models as well. 
For writing, Amanda will push in to support Maisie. And for reading and math, Maisie stays for our classroom mini lesson and a portion of the independent work time. That way I'm able to work with Maisie and her needs in reading and math. And then Maisie is also supported by Amanda for reading and math outside of the classroom. So I see her in our resource room for reading and math, but I don't see her for writing in the resource room because I am pushing in because Maisie has amazing ideas when it comes to writing. Um, she loves to talk. She has amazing things to share. And so um, really we're working on that fine motor practice for her of being able to write appropriate letters, spacing. And so, you know, that's not a reason to be out of the classroom. Um, she's able to write the same stories as her peers with some accommodations and some support. So I get to push in with Peggy and work together as a team. And Amanda, how do you communicate as a team? To benefit the students in your classroom? So Peggy and I, we have our traditional ways through email. Um, we have teacher input forms that we use for IEP, more formal things. Um, but we do a lot of informal, what we like to call touch points, where we're just passing in the hallway or passing in the classroom and just a quick sidebar. Um, and it kind of helps us, you know, quickly catch up and problem solve on the go. But the team isn't just us. Um, the team, it moves and you know, last year's teammates we've had to communicate with because, as Kelsey said, there are changes to the team. Um, and, you know, we're communicating throughout the years. We're making sure, you know, she's with peers that she was familiar with last year in her classroom this year um, to help with that transition, um, looking at that class makeup, having some neighborhood friends. Um, because, like Kelsey said, you know, it takes her a little bit sometimes to warm up. And so we're just trying to support her um, as best as possible. And it's not just Peggy and it's her entire team, the entire community working for her. Um, and, you know, when tweaks need to be made to that IEP, we're able to change it and make appropriate adjustments because that IEP is an evolving document. It's never set in stone. We can make amendments and adapt things because of what we're seeing and the data that we're collecting. Thank you. Um, and speaking about Macy and her peers. Um, Kelsey, have you seen Macy interact with her peers? So her favorite time of the day are recess, those social interactions. And, you know, we have noticed that as the years have gone on, it gets a little harder for her. So we have that communication disorder, but we also have just the notice that things are a little different. So the team has done a wonderful job of figuring out how we can incorporate her. Uh, we can make sure that she feels included and engaged. Uh, we have a lunch bunch that they do every Wednesday, I believe, where she gets to be with a smaller group of peers and she can talk with them in a smaller setting. So that's a wonderful way and, and some other ways too. Great. Um, and Macy did talk about the lunch bunch, but we'll want to hear more about that. Amanda, can you share how does lunch bunch support all students involved? So for Lunch Bunch, it's myself. We have our wonderful speech pathologist and our social work. We rotate the adult hosting every week. And we have a group of eight students. And they're old friends of Maisie's. Some are new friends of Maisie's. And it really is supporting everybody because I'm sure we all know a first grader in our life that sometimes wants to say whatever they want and isn't aware of, you know, the people around them. And so it's, you know, teaching all the students how to have conversations and interact with their peers and have that reciprocating conversation and talk about common topics. Um, it's really helpful for Maisie because she's making some friends with students she might not have um, because they're maybe a little outside of her comfort zone. Um, but we're also helping helping other students strengthen their social skills because they might be this child that's always talking about football when nobody else wants to hear about it. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Peggy, how does inclusion benefit everyone, right? How does inclusion benefit everyone in the classroom, the teachers, the students? Inclusion benefits students in the classroom through building empathy towards one another, learning alongside others that might have differences. They learn how to celebrate each other's talents in our classroom community. They also learn how to problem solve at an appropriate age. 
and they're problem solving with their peers together. It also benefits teachers because you're collaborating with others and you have a team that you can rely on. You can share your tips and different teaching strategies. So you're able to build your own teaching strategies to meet the device, the di diverse learners in your classroom through the inclusion and the team that you're working with. Great, great. And Kelsey, I just want to ask, uh, what do high expectations look like for your family? You know, our high expectations really go along with what Maisie is wanting for herself. So Maisie talks about having a family someday. She talks about different jobs she wants to be. Uh, at this point, it is things like owning an ice cream shop, or uh, at one point she wanted to be the one that picks out all of the colors and builds playground structures. So what can we do to support her in those needs that she has? Talking about driving, those things. So just making sure that we're matching her expectations. And we know that those high expectations will lead to the most positive outcomes for her. So making sure we give her all those supports and tools in place to reach what she desires to do. We want to empower her and we're really grateful for our the team that we have and, and trust that they're doing the same on their end too, making sure to empower her and have her maintain those high expectations at school also. Thank you. And please join me in thanking our panel members, hearing about their experiences and the team approach to navigating the transitions while always looking towards the future and preparing what is next is, is so helpful. Um, this initiative is all about high expectations, engagement, empowerment, and this is a good reminder of what it takes and how important those are. Now I'll turn back and give it over to David for some observations. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate this, the information that was provided by that panel. And what it highlighted is multiple things that I think we need to pay attention to. First, the transition challenges and preparation, how important this is as a part of this. They, 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 many of these individuals talked about the importance of what we're talking and we're this. But this panel, consisting of a parent, a uh, parent, uh, first grade teacher, and a special education resource teacher, looked at this from a very different perspective than we typically do when we think about this level. We have to think about this starting, starting transition at a much younger age. I'm not doing this to scare you, but to think about what we can do as a part of getting these kids ready for post-school life at a very young age. But there's th several things that I want to talk about this and emphasize where we're, where we're going with this. Okay? Their, their, their diverse perspective really helped us understand things. Okay? The important thing first, student engagement at learning. Maisie shared her positive experiences at school, particularly enjoying recess and the Lunch Bunch program. This, this is really creates a positive interaction with her among her teams. Second, the educational teamwork and support. The discussion understands the importance of collaboration in supporting schools and students with, and, and their special needs and understanding how to move this forward. Third, inclusion and empowerment. The benefits of inclusion in the classroom for both students and teachers were discussed. Through inclusion, students learn empathy, problem solving, and celebrate each other's talents, while teachers enhance their strategies to meet diverse learning needs. Kelsey emphasized the importance of high expectations for Casey's future, reflecting a commitment to empowering students to achieve their dreams. Next, a holistic approach to education. The conversation highlighted the holistic approach needed to support students transition effectively. And finally, the future aspirations and support. The panel concluded with a focus on the future, reinforcing the theme that high expectations, engagement, and empowerment are key to navigating transition successfully. The next panel will focus on the complexities of the middle years, a pivotal time when self-advocacy determination and preparation for secondary transition becomes increasingly and importantly crucial. I look forward to this as I hope the discussion will delve into the challenges and triumphs of what it goes on in, this, in these school years and talk about what's going on. But let's begin by hearing from our panelists about how the school year is unfolding for each of them and explore the lessons learned and any strategies developed for navigating the educational landscape. Please join me in a warm welcome for Paula, Domas, Maya, and Principal Washington. Thanks, David. Now, please join me in welcoming our second panel to talk about the middle years. 
when knowing what to expect about secondary transition, including increased self-advocacy and determination are so critical. So today we have Paola Jordan, director of the Metropolitan Parent Center in New York. Her twins, Tomas and Maya, who are students in New York City, New York, and Principal Washington, who was their principal um, from West Prep Academy in New York City, New York as well. And so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to start off with Paola, Thomas, and Maya, if I may. Um, and and I'm going to ask each of you the same question. Um, let's start by hearing a little bit about how the school year is going for each of you. You want to set them up? All right. So uh, right now, um, in this current day, my school year is going pretty well. Um, last year, I was in a program in my school called uh, Waterfront that kind of helps prep me for the CT program that we go into. It's like a Kind of like extracurricular activity that happens throughout the day not after school that um we've kind of each specify in um, one main like subject that we like i know there's one for diving there's one for marine agriculture there's one for um, marine biology there's one for um ocean engineering um i chose to do vessel operations which is everything to learn about um operating and in a way maintaining boats like navigation um, how to even know where to go on a map and just pretty much stuff like that. Um, so far it's been going great. Um, I'm playing pretty good grades. Um, kind of helps me to become a leader, I guess, since we are, um, I mean, it's only us and the crew on the water. We have no one there but ourselves. So it kind of teaches you a mentality that, um, sometimes you don't really need to think just about yourself, but about everybody else too. So it kind of helps you not to be too selfish. Thank you, Tomas. Um, I mean, can we hear a little bit about your school year? For me, the school years so far have been pretty relaxing, you know. Um, I've been managing my time well with all the assignments, tests, midterms. And on the side, as an extracurricular, um, I'm an intern at a sailing company. Um, we teach kids how to sail, and we also maintain the boats. Um, and I just finished getting my certifications over, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, and other than that, my grades have been fine, and it's been pretty fun. I think that the beginning of the school year was um, rocky. It's always a little bit rocky until you find your way with the routine. But right now, uh, both of them, they have identified the activities that are really uh, channeling their skills and what they really want to do so that that was it took a little bit of time for us to identify that but both of them took the leadership here at home to say what exactly they would like to do after school and the elective uh, classes that they have in the school because Tomas goes to a career technical edu education program and Maya goes to a more traditional high school more academic high school well, thank you thank you Maya well thank you for all that and hope you are doing Awesome stuff. It was great to hear about it. Thank you for sharing it. Um, Paula, I have a question follow-up for you. Mm -hmm. um, having twins that attend different schools sounds like it can be challenging. Um, how did you prepare for that? And what was one of the biggest challenges you faced? I think that it was it was difficult because from kindergarten up to eighth grade, they used to go to the same program, the same school, different programs. And I think preparation started when they transitioned to middle school, when we engaged in conversations with the school principal, the special educator teachers, the therapists, and not only that, we intentionally invited both of them to come to their meetings. And it was a whole process because the, the, I will say that one of the pretty unique challenges of parents that have more than one student who receives services is that we need to really center ourselves and talk about them as individuals because it's, it can be a little bit convenient when they're going to the same school and probably kind of miss that we are talking about two different people. Like it's different. Every person is unique. And that takes time because sometimes we're thinking about the convenience of the parent, or maybe we as parents, we don't 
we don't really know very well how to articulate what we need from each one of them. So it was it was a lot of work from me being invested in learning about what they need, the supports that they needed it, what the school need, has to offer for us, for us. And not only that, I think that the transition to middle school was crucial for both of them to put the foundation in their self-advocacy skills and have a voice instead of me being the only voice in the process and just to respect their opinion. So I think that those three years were pretty intense because we had COVID in the middle and that that really put um, um, the challenge for all of us, school and here at home to be aligned with what they need for, 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 for both of them. All right, thank you. And going to different schools means that the mass and Maya, that, that means that both of you must be very independent. Um, so let me ask you, what has been the most helpful to you in learning how to advocate for your needs? Well, for me, 100% is to be um, there present and actually have a voice in the IEP meetings. I mean, um, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't really have um, the services that I have now. And you can't really do much if you have someone else speaking on your behalf, because at the end of the day, the people around you is talking about you and about your services. They're not you. They don't know what you necessarily deeply want. Only you can truly know what you want. So just being there to see everything, to see the process, especially at an early age, since I started that um, pretty young, um, you kind of have a feel and you kind of get used to the environment and it makes every year a bit more smoother for your services with what you need and what you don't need. Because there's nothing worse than having a service that you don't need anymore. And Maya? Um, it's pretty helpful being present in an IEP meeting. You're able to bring up issues that you have with like teachers or, well, not really with other students that really have that problem, but mostly with teachers. Um, sometimes you're not getting the adequate services or sometimes you don't want a certain type of service anymore. Mainly if it's like taking away at your classes or your time. So, I mean, the best way to improve that, have improved my advocacy skills are being present at the meetings itself. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Tom, for that. And thank you for Principal Washington for being patient with us I and hearing these stories. But I also want to go to you now because you were principal to Maya and Thomas before. So I want to ask you, Principal Washington, how do you engage, how do you empower, how do you help families understand not only the IDEA requirements, but experience the intent of the law in your school? Thank you, and I appreciate that question. It was great listening to Paula and, and Maya and Tomas. I've been two years departed from our community and to see the growth and development is, is amazing. Uh, our vision at West Prep is with the work of all, we build a capable, caring, and inspired community. And so that really lends itself to supporting the IEP process and helping families to understand what their rights are. Uh, we are a small middle school in uh, the Upper West Side of Manhattan, but 50% of our students have IEPs. And so when you have half of your students with IEPs, you look at everyone as having an IEP. And so we're essentially creating an individualized education plan for all students in schools. And so particularly for our students with IEPs, we wanna first let families know that we're delivering services and not destinations for IEPs. And just because you have a classification doesn't mean that your education has to be the same as someone else with the classification. And so we really pour into the IEP document and look at what's there so that we can provide the necessary supports for our students. As you listen to Tomas talk about some uh, supports that they do need and some that they don't need. We wanna make sure that we're involved in the families and the students to talk about what's gonna make you successful here and what makes you successful in elementary school may not make you successful in a, a middle school. And so we wanna work with the families that have an open door policy and participate in all the IEP meetings, making sure that everybody understands and that everybody on the team understands what that child needs to be successful. Thank you, Principal Washington. And I know you mentioned it's been two years since the Mons and Maya have been part of your community, but can you explain how did you help support not only the twins, but Paola and how 
you prepare them for transition? Yes. Uh, so it's interesting. You know, I try to develop relationships with my families. I try to be a, a very visible principal standing in front of the school, again, opening my doors to families. Ms. P uh, Paula uh, is a fierce advocate for her babies. Uh, she and I develop a close relationship because this was her first time with middle schoolers. You know, these were the first time that she had 11 and 12 year olds changing classes and going to a middle school. And so working with Paula to help her to understand uh, the happenings of middle school, working with the students to help them find their individuality, which was important because in elementary school, you tend to kind of speak for the children and they're in the same class, they're in the same school. And so we give them the same things and off they go. But Maya and Tomas are very, two very different people. Uh, and so with Tomas, you know, really helping with his motivation skills, making sure that he didn't get lost uh, and uh, all the other students that are at the school, uh, we prepare all of our students to take uh, high school regents level courses uh, algebra, uh, Spanish, uh, biology, and so getting Tomas motivated for those rigorous courses because we knew he could do it. And so we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with Tomas supporting him, uh, group meetings with him to get him on board, and uh, he was successful when he left. Uh, the program that Maya was in catered uh, to helping her develop uh, speech and uh, social interaction skills. And over the course of uh, two years, you know, she started to master those skills. Maya came in with a lot of sensory issues. We were concerned about her being in band and being too much noise, but she thrived at that. Uh, she didn't really uh, advocate for herself at the beginning of sixth grade, but by the time she got in seventh grade, she had made a lot of friends. She was advocating for more work in class. And by the time she got to eighth grade, she came to me personally and said, you know, I'm not sure if I really need to be in speech anymore because I, I'm, I'm here sitting in your office advocating for myself. And so without having to reconvene the meeting, you know, actually knowing my student and knowing my parent, I said, fine, I, this is evidence enough that you have developed these social skills. And so I believe we are done with speech for you. And so we allowed Maya to transition to a different program. And so it's about knowing who your students are and doing what you need to do to support them in that moment. Thank you, Principal Washington, for that answer. Um, and Bala, I do want to go back to you because we, we've been speaking a, a lot about academics, um, but there's also a lot on mental health need as being important for young adults. Can you talk a little bit about what you are doing to ensure that there's not just a focus on academics, but the other areas of your twins' development? for example, that include mental health so that they can continue to be successful? We we have the privilege to have, uh, to be in a small middle school where everybody knows everybody, where the principal is always available. He has a uh, policy of open doors. He's accessible to families in different ways. It can be in person, by phone or by email. We find the best way to communicate where their IP team are there available for us, the counselors. And uh, we have the situation around COVID that we all know, and there is now there's evidence about the impact in mental health and students and families. And we experienced some of issues, some of those issues here at home. And the first person that I reached out to was Mr. Washington and um, his team of counselors at school, because it's Maya and Tomas had different counselors. And what we did is we reconvene, we reconvene, we have a meeting, we discuss what we needed to do. And when it was time for us to have our annual IEP, we intentionally include an IEP goal for mental health. And we connected that IEP goal with the counseling sessions and with the frequency of those sessions and who else was gonna be part of those sessions. Thank you, thank you. And Principal Washington, just one final question for today. How do you build your staff's capacity to support families and youth? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when looking at these IEPs, when we get kids in the sixth grade, they're 11 years old. And so that's been written by a teacher that we have no knowledge of. So before the start of the school year, we bring t teachers in to deliberately go through the chapter 408 process where we're reading every child's into, uh, IEP to make sure that we are uh, targeting instruction for them. It's also about building psychologically safe spaces for the adults. And so we're really big on social emotional learning at West Prep Academy. And so making sure that the teachers are well versed in their emotional intelligence so that they can create those spaces for our students and build that emotional vocabulary so that they can become emotionally intelligent. 
because we know middle school can be a trying year, uh, leaving out of elementary school and getting ready for high school. And so it's about creating that safe space for them so all children feel welcome. We want to build a fully inclusive model in our school where everyone feels welcome. Again, going back to our vision about what the work of all, we want families to feel welcome, we want our students to feel welcome, and we want our teachers and staff to feel in a safe space so that they can deliver those high quality instructional lessons for our students. Thank you, Principal Washington. And thank you, Paola, Thomas, Maya, all of you for your stories. This has been fantastic. Um, and I'm happy that all of you had the opportunity to share it as well. Now let's hear from David again. The discussion in the middle years and the transition to secondary emphasized several very important points. First, the diverse educational experiences and leadership development was necessary. The twins attending different schools in New York City share their unique educational journeys. Thomas is part of a program focusing on, on op vessel operations, teaching leadership and teamwork, critical for self-reliance and collective safety on the water, while Maya has been engaged in sailing as an extracurricular activity, which has allowed her to manage her academic responsibilities effectively and enjoy her high school experiences. But this brings up multiple points about this. The parental, parental involvement in individual advocacy, the twin's mother, highlighted the challenge and strategy of parenting twins with distinct needs and personalities, emphasizing the transition to middle school. She emphasized the importance of self-advocacy and being part of her child's IEP programs. But on also, this, this session raised the importance of self-advocacy and educational planning. Both Thomas and Maya stressed the significance of being active participants in their IEP meetings, something that is vital as what we talk about this. They discussed how soft advocacy has been crucial in receiving the support they need and eliminating unnecessary services. But then we also have the important role of the principal. Principal Washington from West Prep Academy shared insights into creating an inclusive and supportive educational environment. He discussed the school's approach to individualized education, emphasizing the importance of understanding and meeting each student's needs. Two, three other points that I wanna raise. The mental health and holistic development. The discussion also covered the importance of balancing academic goals with mental health and overall well being. The twins' mother mentioned the proactive steps needed to address the twins' mental health needs, especially during challenging times like the COVID 19 pandemic, and transition to adulthood and life skills. The twins shared how their experiences have prepared them for adulthood, highlighting the importance of crucial life skills such as time management soft advocacy and emotional regulation. As we talked earlier about soft skills, these are vital as a part of the process. Finally, the principal talked about staff capacity building at the, at the, for family support. Principal Washington concluded by discussing the importance of staff development in supporting families and students. By fostering a psychologically safe environment and focusing on social emotional learning, the school aims to create a welcoming and inclusive community for all students of learning. Which brings us to our final panel, and it's with this with I'm really excited about this. Their combined experience will look at a, this from a unique lens and through ways to explore challenges. Let's begin by getting to know each one of our panelists, starting with their background, their roles, and how they've come to be involved in the work they're due. Their stories hopefully will be testimonies of individual achievement, but also how the power of collaboration, support, and the human spirit resilience. Ruben, Sarah, Catherine, thank you all for being here. It's an honor to have you with us to share your experiences. Thanks again, David. Uh, that is a great segue into our third and last panel. Um, please help me to welcome Ruben Flores, a VR client and recent college graduate. Sarah Mora, vocational rehabilitation counselor specialist. Oregon State Commission for the Blind, OCB, um, and Catherine Edgar Mason, the deaf and hard of hearing counselor specialist, the Oregon Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, or OERS. And I just wanna thank you all for being here. And I want to hear a little bit about yourselves, just a little. Um, so we can start with, Kathy. Oh, I thought you'd start with Ruben. Okay. Um, I am Kathy. I work out of um, an office in Salem, which is the capital of Oregon. 
deaf and hard of hearing specialist for the state. And I have been doing my job for 25 years in Salem and five additional in New Hampshire. So 30 years total. Thank you. And Sarah? I'm uh, Sarah Mora, and I'm a vocational rehabilitation specialist working with individuals who are blind, low vision, and deafblind for the state of Oregon. And I've been in my current position for 10 years, 10 years this past January. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Ruben. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ruben Flores. I am a recent college graduate, got my degree in uh, counseling, and I got my mind, my, my um, so that was my major, and then my minor was in music. Um, I am a father of twins as of this last month, along with a two and a half year old. So um, I'm very, very, very blessed in that sense. And um, yeah, no, that's a little snapshot of who I am. Thank you, Ruben. And I didn't start with you because your first question is going to go straight to you um, is, <laughs> How did special education staff and your VR counselors support you with making informed choices and with general decision-making about your own future? Yeah, of course. So um, I actually got a ton of help and support from um, VR. It, it, it actually took many forms just because when you start off at that age, there's it, it, you know, there's just so much you don't know. Um, I remember I went from work, working with the um, with the ESD uh, at the time, and you know, at this point, I was uh, just now starting to figure out my way around the world in a sense, just uh, being blind. You know, I, I was diagnosed um, when I was or uh, around ten years old. But a lot of the, because I had a condition that was progressive, it wasn't something that truly, you know, that I was able to truly process at the time or that I really had to deal with at the time. Um, my sight actually didn't start to go away until I turned um, 15. This is where I really started to notice it. Up to that point, I had quite a bit of sight. I, I, was, I, um, I was wearing hearing aids uh, because that was more of a, that one definitely was causing more problems early on. But anyway... Um, you know, I, I'm a, uh, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college and, um, in, in many ways, you know, that the first person to have to, to, to end up exploring even those type of career options. Um, I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I was, um, uh, born in Mexico and, um, I moved here when I was one and, you know, our dream was just to be able to have opportunity, um, opportunity for a new future, a new uh, a future where we could make a difference. And, you know, when I lost my sight, I was afraid that that future would be gone for me. And that's where, you know, the, um, that's where all of that support just was life changing. Um, if I were to talk, there, there, when I mentioned earlier, that there are multiple dimensions. One of those dimensions is, um, you know, was just in a way, trying to navigate that world. So OCV, um, along with WSD, helped me be able to figure out, you know, moving around with a cane, um, trying to figure out transportation, which at the time felt like impossible things to try to figure out without my sight. And, um, you know, they also provided support in communication, you know, uh, uh, with a lot of the either um, already existing um, options like Braille or, you know, a lot of the new ones like screen readers and all these um, different forms of um, adaptive technology. And that, that was extremely, extremely helpful to kind of, in, in a, a sense, establish that foundation, um, you know, to start working on that. And that started building my confidence little by little, especially because up to that point, I had, you know, in, in my mind, I just, I didn't know what I was doing. I was afraid. I was 15. I, I am the, the 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 world that I was envisioning was no longer, you know, was no longer going to look like what I wanted it to look like or what I thought it was going to look like. But after getting some of that help automatically, it started boosting that confidence. It started building up. Um, yeah, it started building up that confidence that 
there are more possibilities and um vr you know they 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 were contacting me about you know life after high school which at the time you know high school itself was just you know it felt like its own challenge um and to think about even the possibility of a career it, it wasn't it didn't feel like a possibility at the time but vr really um you know, they, they stepped in and they said, Ruben, that um, you are capable and you we can help you. We can help you figure out what you would like to do, how we would you like to do it. And um, it, that framework really set that up, you know. Um, we uh, Kathy, when she connected with me, she helped me a lot with the research portion. You know, she talked to me about what is what is it going to look like? What, what, where would you like to be? What are you passionate about? What would you like to do? And right. then and once we talk I, about that, we were able to. Right, Sorry. and and I'll I'll stop there just because you you just mentioned Kathy, um, mm -hmm. and I want to ask a little bit more about that before you go on. Kathy, of did course, in pursue work-based learning experiences or job shadowing or internships as a service towards his employment goal. Uh, he just spoke about those necessary services post high school. Um, and Sarah, you're more than welcome to answer part of this question as well. Well, actually, um, Sarah did the majority of the work experiences through her SWEP program, which she's got Great. in her background. Um, so I'll let her talk a little bit about SWEP, and I focus more on the career exploration, the research part, as Ruben was talking about, what are your strengths, what are your skills, what are your interests, which at the time, Ruben has not mentioned, he's a very accomplished pianist. And at the time, his interests were, you know, music and had some substantial music scholarships that helped him along the way. And then um, math. And so we were going down the music and math path at the time. Um, so yeah, we did more research and which colleges have which programs and um, which is the best fit, which is gonna work best mobility wise, that kind of thing. And I think I should let Sarah talk more about work-based learning, SWEP, internships, perhaps. Thank you. So um, Oregon Commission for the Blind has three actual summer work experience programs, two of which are residential and one that is community-based. Um, Salem is the one that Ruben started off with, and this is an initial program for younger students, 16, and we can accept students 16 to 20. Um, but typically younger students or students who have a higher level of need in terms of learning their independent living skills, um, their orientation and mobility, they start off with Salem program, and then they graduate into the Portland program, which is um, a little bit more independent, college focused, and requires a certain level of o and orientation and mobility. Um, they're required to be able to independently travel to and from their work site in Portland. So Ruben started off in the Salem program, and we try to find what students are interested in and try to find um, work experiences that connect with those interests. And the first year, I remember that Ruben was working in a, um, I believe it was Capital Toyota um, showroom. And so he was doing some of the cleaning of the main showroom area, but they allowed for him to play his piano. Um, he had a keyboard. They allowed for him to play like during breaks or dur various uh, points during the day. So we were able to wrap that interest of music into the work experience. Um, the other piece of the program is focusing on those independent living skills. And so sometimes students haven't had a lot of um, training or experience with cooking or cleaning um, or even their orientation and mobility. And we focus on that as also part of the program. Thank you to yeah, you absolutely. really sharing that perspective and yeah. and that insight and and Ruben, we stopped um, earlier at your post high school, right? Um, and I'm wondering, how did your goals and vision for the future evolve over time? 
And is there anything you wished you learned earlier in your education and career pathway? That's a great question. Um, so uh, for me, I definitely, there was definitely a change throughout the years on kind of where I wanted to be. Um, and part of it uh, was just life experience. And part of it was what it was the education part. Um, as Kathy mentioned earlier, I, um, I am a pianist and I, uh, that was one of the skills where I really excelled in as well as math. They were my comfort areas. Um, and there were areas that I thrived in. And I knew for myself, I really wanted to, um, you know, I, I wanted to be able to turn those things into a career. Uh, behind those desires, there was a philosophy that I always um, had maintained, and um, that was that I just wanted to be able to make a difference in the world. I wanted to be able to um, to make change or just to be able to help others. And, you know, right before I lost my sight, my ambition was to either, uh, it was a, I was looking actually into potentially doing some counseling, be able to do, um, or even other um, other careers that involved um, being able to help people, very humanitarian type of things. And uh, I did end up leaving some of those behind more just because I didn't think that I was going to be able to do it with my, um, the capacity that I thought I had at the time. So I did pursue music and I did pursue math and I felt comfortable just because they were, you know, again, my areas of comfort. I did really well in those areas and I was able to get a lot of scholarships and I was able to um, get accepted to a lot of universities um, to be able to study in those areas. So I did work um, with music. I did major in music for um, uh, about almost two years um, of my of college and it was a, it was really wonderful but um uh, a, a combination of you know just being able to um th there was a lot that happened that made it so that i did end up transitioning from that into counseling and one of them was that i did have an injury um of the, that um you know with my hands and so uh we were uh, i was not able to play to the same level that i would have been playing for a while and that in itself kind of had me step back and reassess and kind of, for a while it did kind of shake me for a bit, just because again, you know, it's your comfort zone. You you, you feel good in your comfort zone and it's hard to step out of it. And um, in the many ways that did force me to stay out of it. And there was a spot of vulnerability because all of a sudden I realized, wow, I, I, the, I, I do need to take a different route, but it's also scary. Um, and, you know, um, um, I had a lot of support, you know, I met with Kathy and Sarah and, and they encouraged me and, um, you know, I did spend some time kind of reevaluating and eventually I was able to come back to college and I was able to, um, you know, uh, they gave the, um, I was able to do a lot of that research and really look back and say, Hey, I think I can do this. I think I can go back and do, um, you know, be able to um, take that counseling career, um, whether, you know, um, and hopefully rehabilitation, but that's kind of where, that's kind of where it changed for me. If, if I could add, again. yes, please. If I could add, um, uh, you had asked about information interviews and job shadows. Um, this was one area where I was able to introduce Ruben to a blind VR counselor. And how long did you spend with her, Ruben? About a day or a we, couple hours? Yeah, we spent a couple hours <laughs> over the phone. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And so I, I think that was hopefully a helpful thing um, in looking at VR as a potential option for employment. Um, and being able to talk with somebody with the same disability that was actually doing the job. So. Yeah, that is that is absolutely right. That, that actually, I'm really glad you brought that up because that was instrumental. Again, when I, I, I earlier I mentioned that I there were a lot of things that didn't seem quite possible to me, even as a because even you know for a while I was still learning, <laughs> I was still trying to figure out um, uh, life as a, a blind person, especially since. Uh, 
you know, my, my condition was fairly progressive and being able to have those resources, being able to talk to um, others who had gone through what I did, um, that just completely changed the way I viewed that. Um, and in a lot of ways did give me that hope that helped me push forward. Thank you, Ruben. And really, I just want to say, just as you've mentioned, those stories have pushed you forward. Your story is going to do that and more. So thank you for sharing it. Thank you for being confident and being able to come on and letting us hear it. Um, and I also want to thank at this time, Kathy and Sarah, who you both have described the very needed relationship across special education services um, and why it's so important for those supports to be there. And I want to take one final moment just to thank all the panelists uh, who have shared not only their stories, their experiences, but their challenges and so on. The third panel's discussion focused on the experiences of Ruben, a powerful statements by a, a, a vocational rehabilitation client and recent college graduate, along with insights from Sarah Moore, a vocational rehabilitation counselor, specialist at the Oregon State Commission for the Blind, and Catherine Edgar Mason, a deaf and hard of hearing counselor, specialist in the Oregon Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. I'm going to summarize these in their points, which I really told you I was excited beforehand, but I'm going to summarize them with some, with some interesting uh, points about where we are. First, Ruben's journey and support from VR. Ruben shared his journey from being diagnosed with a progressive condition that led to blindness at age 15 to becoming the first in his family to graduate from college. He highlighted the significant support he received from VR, which helped him navigate the world without sight, explore career options, and build confidence in his abilities. VR support was instrumental in establishing a foundation for Ruben's future, teaching him to use adaptive technologies and assist with transportation challenges. Second, career exploration and education pathways. Catherine and Sarah eloquently discuss, discussed their roles in supporting Ruben's career explorations and educational pathways. Catherine focused on research, researching career options and colleges that would fit Ruben's interests and needs, particularly highlighting his talents as a pianist and his interest in music and math. Sarah elaborated on, on the work-based learning experiences provided through Oregon Commission for the Blind Summer Work Experiences Programs, which aimed to connect students' interests with relevant work experience and build their independent living skills. Third, the importance of independent living skills. The, this panel underscored the importance of teaching independent living skills, such as cooking, cleaning, managing finances, and orientation and mobility training. These skills are part of the comprehensive support needed for, to Ruben and other students through VR summer programs, tailored to their individual needs based on thorough assessments. Fourth, the evolution of goals and the importance and value of self-advocacy. Ruben's goals and vision, visions for the future evolved over time, from focusing on music to pursuing a degree in counseling. This shift was influenced by life experiences, including an injury that impacted his ability to play piano at the professional level. Throughout this process, Ruben learned the importance of self-advocacy and reassessing his career path, ultimately finding a new direction that aligned with his desire to make a difference in the world. And fifth, mentorship and professional connections. A critical aspect of Ruben's journey was the opportunity to connect with professionals in the field of interest, including a blind VR counselor. These connections provided Ruben with tangible examples of what it could be achieved despite his disability, further motivating him to pursue a career in counseling. The panel discussion highlighted the collaborative efforts between special education services and voc rehabilitation supporting individuals with disabilities throughout their education and career paths. Ruben's story exemplifies the positive outcomes that can result from tailored support, self-advocacy, and the willingness to adapt and explore new opportunities. We are lucky to have heard from him today. At this point, I'd like to take the time to invite Valerie and Dante back to assist with answering questions that have been posed as a part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Greatly appreciate that. Those panels were stellar, absolutely stellar. 
I am uh, so grateful that, that we were able to get the participants on that we have had on today. And I can tell by all the hearts and all the clapping emojis that I see that everyone else feels the same. Um, if we could invite the um, all of our other participants back onto camera right now, that would be great. Um, and I just wanted to mention also that unfortunately Ruben couldn't stay on with us, but that we do have Kathy still on with us so that everyone is aware. But if all the panelists would come back, that would be great. Um, we have a handful of questions that we wanna go over before we have to wrap things up, but we, we couldn't just leave it like this um, because I think everyone is thinking about um, what this means for them and their work and their families and things of that nature. So we have a handful of questions. Um, Commissioner Allen and I are going to um, run through that we have seen things that we think might be helpful to the audience um, and I want to start with Kelsey. Um, so Kelsey, um, Macy is, is a, a show stealer. And can you tell us more about her experience with inclusion and what types of specific supports were most helpful for her, both um, social and in her academic development? Yeah, certainly. You know, I, I think it really comes down to having the correct mindset one where we always foster that sense of inclusion for everyone, that mindset where we know all students belong. And it's just a matter of giving them that support that they need so that they can feel comfortable and access their education, be it academic or social. So I can easily say that in her elementary years, there really hasn't been a suggestion that she wouldn't be included because of her disability or her need for accommodations. And most of her time has spent with her same age peers in the general education setting. So sometimes she gets that support in the classroom, sometimes she gets it in the resource room, but in terms of those specific supports, there are a few things that really do stand out. At the building level, there is a program that they do that's called the Positivity Project. This is a school-wide program that empowers students to build positive relationships, become their best selves by focusing on a different character strength every week. So it's a reminder that everyone in the school just of their potential to be better human beings. And it's not something that's necessarily written into our IEP, but it's a building-wide program and it fosters that sense of belonging and kindness for those students. So you can really see that reflected in the student body. At the classroom level, we talked about that lunch bunch. So that weekly opportunity where Basie and a handful of her friends are in a smaller setting. And this is an accommodation that it just makes it easier for her to converse with her peers as opposed to a loud lunchroom where there's a lot going on. And believe it or not, we've even had peers reach out. Her teacher has told me and they want to join the lunch bunch. So <laughs> they want even more. <laughs> So it's something that we see working for everybody. And then I, I think from more of an academic perspective, just the benefits of having a team of educators who are willing to be creative with the materials and their approach to educating their students. So it could be using a physical cue, such as arm tapping when we're sounding out words or manipulatives. Uh, that resource teacher, Amanda, that we saw actually realized she isn't doing um, she doesn't really love using those rainbow bears, but she's talking a lot about chicken nuggets and about certain dips. So our math right now is about using chicken nuggets and different sauces. We're working on some of our math problems that way. So just making sure that we have that personalized learning experience, that's where we see a lot of wonderful things happen. Thank you. I will never look at chicken nuggets the same way. <laughs> Dante, do you have a question? Sure. And this question I'll turn over to uh, Paola. Uh, Thomas and Maya both talked about the importance of being present and active in their own IEP meetings to ensure that they get the services that they need or even uh, stop getting services they no longer need. Paola, how did you help them become so involved in that process? Thank you for the question. I think that for them to be involved in the IEP process, it took years of practice. When I say years, think about it that first grade when parent-teacher conference was student-led and they had the support and the expectation that they need to be there. They had the opportunity to practice and be able to participate with adults in a meeting where we were talking about with them about the things that they needed it. And I think that Tomas attended his uh, first IEP probably around fifth grade, but for Maya, it really took more time because with her, uh, it was a little bit more complex, the whole language component. She was part of the New York City ASD NEST specialized program, which is specifically for autistic students, and they are included within their uh, general ed community. And when she needed it to, when we needed for her to have a voice at the meeting, 
we offer her different choices. And when she was um, first grade, she started doing drawings, then notes, then she moved to letters. At a certain point, we have to use something out of the box, and that was voice recordings. And I think that the first time, if I'm not mistaken, when she really started actively participating in person was in middle school. And this is because Mr. Washington, our middle school principal, he was instrumental for her to reach this milestone. He assisted us with pre meetings with her, and we reinforced collectively here at home and at school that the expectation was for her to be there and that she needs to be an active participant of the IEP. And since then, even now that she's in high school, she's consistently doing it. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And um, Paula, I have a, a follow-up question, but I also wanna tell you that um, just, this is still February, just earlier this month, um, I had an IEP meeting, our team met for my son, um, who is in the seventh grade now, and mm. he came to the IEP meeting, um, and he contributed, and that was the very first time. So wow. that that self advocacy absolutely makes a ton of difference. Um, the team is great, and things were going well, but you could tell that his presence positively impacted our discussions and what was going on um, about about what he thought he needed, as well as what all the rest of us were thinking. So thank you absolutely for sharing that. I wanted to validate that and um, ask you also that um, you've done some great work with the Region 1 um, Parent Center. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. And first of all, thank you for sharing because it, it speaks volumes that you're speaking to your audience from the personal uh, area. And we appreciate that very much, Valerie. So the Region 1 Parent Centered Collaborative is uh, one of the few ones in the country, and we serve families in New York City and the Lone Island region. We are four parent centers, it's Synergia, the Lone Island Advocacy Parent Center, Advocates for Children of New York, and Include NYC. And last year, we worked together on a project for families of youth and self-advocates and professionals. And for the first part of the project, uh, Valerie, we created a short film with a diverse group of self-advocates and their parents where I had the opportunity to participate with Tomas. And we talk about our hopes and dreams, independence and advocacy. And we finally offer a few words of advice for families and professionals to think about transition to adulthood. The follow-up project that we have uh, was a panel with professionals and they discuss the self-advocacy skills and steps that can lead to a transition that recognize the full potential of students with any disability, including those with profound disabilities like profound autism. Um, in addition to that, the last component that we did, we created a toolkit for resources for our audience, that's made for New York City and Long Island families. And the best part is that we had the opportunity to present this project during the last year OSEP conference. Thank you. Um, I'll pose this next question to Kathy. Kathy, I know that um, Ruben couldn't stay on, um, but he did talk about getting support from VR at a young age. What strategies do you, you use to help create a seamless provision of services across special education and VR services? Um, that's a good question. Um, nowadays, with, when Ruben started, again, this was like five years ago, because he's been in college for five years. Um, so, you know, we weren't as aggressive with pre-employment transition services as we currently are. I know here in Oregon, we do a lot with what we call pre-ets, pre-employment transition services, um, which ideally is geared towards the younger student ages 14 and up. Um, and th that may be more kind of surface area discussion about career ideas, maybe introduction to role models with disabilities, maybe um, let's go visit a particular job site and see what they do there, um, those kinds of things. And so it's not specific and as in depth as I was doing with Ruben as a senior, because I didn't get to meet Ruben until he was a senior. And he had already, Prior to that, done a lot of work with Sarah and the Commission for the Blind with those summer work experiences. So, you know, nowadays it's there's this emphasis on the pre-employment transition services, which is kind of, you can think of it as a gear up to officially opening the rope rehab file and starting the active, more individualized services 
Um, and I like to see students, if I can get them, open and on my caseload by like their junior year. It gives me plenty of time to get to know who they really are as a person. What yeah, are yeah. their strengths? What are their skills? What are their interests? And where are we headed? Are we headed towards employment? Are we headed towards post-secondary education? And what's that going to look like? And what's that? I mentioned earlier that path. I, I, I have this thing about paths. What's our path? <laughs> you know, um, what's the path going to look like to get us there? So, so I think. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think a great follow up is how how do you help to maintain those high expectations for youth with disabilities around college and career exploration? Well, I always, you know, supposing I have a student that comes and wants to be a brain surgeon, but maybe academically it's not in the cards. I would never say that's not realistic. Let's look at what do you like about this goal? What what is it that it tickles your fancy and and what what kinds of jobs a variety of kinds of jobs include that piece that you're so attracted to and maybe there's something within that of well let's go visit you know five different jobs and see what they look like and narrow it, narrow it down in that respect sometimes um well, as a as a parent, sometimes it's the self advocacy of the student themselves, and I applaud parents that are working on the self advocacy piece because what got me so um, enthusiastic about transition as a whole was my own two sons. They're in their thirties now, both with disabilities. But when I looked at their rocky transition experience and the high expectations as a parent that I had, um, we, we advocated our way all the way through it and, um, you know, came out very successfully on the outcome end of things as an adult. So I think it's important to maintain those high expectations and, and looking at the research behind what makes sense for this student. Thank you. So um, we're going to give the very last question before we wrap up to Dr. Bateman um, to kind of, yes, I know, <laughs> need you to bring it home, pull all this together. So given your vast experience with school systems and your work with families, what's the one takeaway um, that you hope attendees leave here with today? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And let me just tell you again how impressed I were was with all the panelists and all the comments and take them taking their their time. Their personal stories are, are just wonderful and I, I applaud all of them for sharing this with us. There's one thing that, it, that I would like to share it, it, for everyone to take away for is the vital importance of collaboration, is that we need to work on this together. And we need to make sure that families are aware of how we can collaborate together with others. And we need to make sure that uh, school districts need to be aware of how they can collaborate with families. This is a, it's a, it's a process yeah. and we have to remind ourselves it's a process and it's not just going to be one meeting that's going to solve or fix what we're doing. It's going to be multiple meetings over time that we need to spend on this and we need to make sure it's a collaborative effort as a part of what we do this. Yeah, I, it is, and I, I applaud uh, Osef for having this workshop because what we need to remind ourselves is the importance of everyone working this together and also that we don't just focus on, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging my one point here, that it's not just the, the older kids, but we need to start thinking about kids at a younger age of what we can do to start. And the parents and the information that we shared from those, which, which it, it was, it was tiered, I, I just love their stories because we need to pay attention to the younger folks because it, it, just waiting to secondary, there are vital, important skills we can teach at elementary age that would be beneficial so that we can focus more on the outside of school activities, just on listening, paying attention, focusing, where to go for help, vital, important things we can do with kids throughout schools that can be across a whole effort, not just focusing on the folk, individuals who deal with transition. But there's, there's so much we can do together then together we're better than the individuals doing it by themselves. And that's what I want to say. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Riley. 
Thank you so much. Um, we could easily continue this discussion for another half hour or longer. I have all these questions swimming around in my mind that I did not get to. Um, very insightful. Um, I, I, I can't even express how happy this makes me. So I want to thank you very much, um, David, Kelsey, Paula, um, Kathy, for wrapping up. Um, but before we do, I want to make sure that we take a moment to highlight our OSERS funded technical assistance centers and all of the terrific work that they're doing around transition. It is invaluable. I hope that you will take a moment um, and look at those resources, utilize the support um, and all the assistance that they offer. Uh, we don't have time to go into those resources today, unfortunately, but there's a lot more information on the 3E website where this recording will also be when it is over. So Dante, what are your thoughts? I uh, just want to echo you, Valerie. Um, I really want to thank our numerous guests for participating in this discussion today and for sharing their personal stories and experiences on knowing what to expect and when it matters. Uh, today would not have been possible without those individual stories. I also wanted to extend um, our gratitude to Johan for facilitating today's symposium. You did a fantastic job. I think there may be a TV hosting job in your future. Um, but on behalf of OSERS, thank you so much. Uh, and finally, want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to join us today as we continue this important conversation. Valerie and I were both hoping that um, our participation jointly is inspiration to say that special ed and vocational rehab should be working very closely in this. And um, you, you all showed how fantastic that can be when it does happen. Absolutely. And I want to just remind everybody before you log off that we do hope to see you again at future events because there will be future events. Um, several throughout the remainder of 2024 are anticipated. So uh, take a moment and regularly visit our website for updated information on events, resources, um, including a link to the OSEP transition guide and the blog series. There's a lot of information for you. Very accessible, very easy to digest and read. Um, also, consider subscribing to any of our social media outlets as a way to stay informed on transition and anything else that you might find useful. So once again, thank you not only for joining us today, but for your continued roles as stewards of support and champions of excellence for our students and the bright futures they deserve because we are here in service to our students. That, that is the bottom line of why we all do this work. Um, and so together we can increase what we expect, how we engage, and how we empower our students and our families to ensure that there is a successful transition for all. So once again, thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.